Good morning, Facebook friends, families, and fellow believers. Welcome back to another Antonio's Christian Podcast. Um, brought to you live here in um, this nice little luxury, little suite I got going on here. I wouldn't say luxuries, but you know, um, thank you guys for joining in. It's also yeah, another beautiful Saturday. It's been a beautiful weekend, a weekend off. Um, thank you for guys for joining in and tuning in continually. Thank you for all those who are supporting me in my ministry um, and just by following along. Um, and for those of us who were here a couple weeks ago when I first started my fear series, because we're in chapter three of my fear series, this, uh, our first chapter was Victory Over Fear, uh, which is, is a cornerstone of my belief simply because knowing that there's so many different things that's going on right now that we need daily victory. And there's so many different things that the enemy is trying to get us to be fearful of. And, you know, it's it takes a strong individual and strong faith in God, our creator, our provider, our Jehovah Jireh, our provider to provide us with the strength and humility to continue moving forward during these dark times. Simply because we still got the coronavirus still going on. We have uh, racism still going on discriminatory behavior, anger, and just a lot of negativity that we see on, on and off social media and just around the world. And I'd like to encourage others to continue to maintain and stay stand fast in the Word of God because only through the Word of God can we really protect ourselves. And I always remind people that to when you get up every morning, not only do you pray, but just give God praise that, you know, that we're alive to encounter another day of his presence. To be in his presence is is like a life altering experience. Um, and we kind of went over the victory over fear in my first chapter. In the second chapter, we kind of went over the victory over relationships, which is the cornerstone, I believe, you know, because if without healthy relationships in our life, and not just not healthy relationships in general, but not having a healthy relationship with God tends to discredit our belief system. And not only discredits it, but it allows us to move on a shaky foundation. And God calls us to be, to live a life more abundantly. And to have an abundant life, I think, honestly, you know, um, through my perspective, is getting up and arming yourself with God's protection. And what I mean by arming yourself is remembering to put on your spiritual armor, not just put on your clothing, but put on your spiritual armor. Um, your spiritual armor that, um, that consists of the belt of truth. Always have integrity. Always tell people the truth. Always come boldly to people and come boldly to God. Because God, you know, you know, is like, he... He acknowledges those who are bold in his word. He wants us to come to him boldly with our love and our faithfulness in him and his direction. So always remember that. Um, next thing, you always, always equip yourself with the breastplate of righteousness. You know, you are the righteous hand of God and you have to be able to uphold that um, and staying firm against the enemy because the enemy is attacking us even more today as he will tomorrow and he will continue to do so to try to discourage our faith. Um, next thing is you always want to put on the shoes of peace. Always be able uh, to not only carry the good news to other believers, but to be able to walk in peace while you're doing it. Because the enemy will often send people to test you, um, to test your faith, to try to get you off track from God's plan. Because God knows, or no, the enemy knows that you have a destiny, you have a purpose in God's kingdom, and he wants to get you off that. Next thing is you want to wear your helmet of salvation. We are, we are saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. We are sanctified to... We have been granted sanctification simply because we follow a most high power God who who is all about love, not control, but love. And that's something we have to operate in on a daily basis. Um, next thing you want to do is make sure you arm yourself with the shield of faith. Protect yourself from all the enemy tactics because, I mean, the father of lies is good at telling us half-truths or lies completely. He is the father of lies. Satan will often tell us that we're not good enough, that we don't measure up, that we should fear all these circumstances going on. And, going on today and that's something that God reminds us through his word that he did not give us a spirit of fear so meaning we have overall victory and you know one thing you know I, something I've, I've seen this past week on another sermon from Ron, Ron McIntosh is that he was right about one of his statements that the devil does have brain damage he thinks he's weakening us during this time of crisis and he really isn't he's not really stopping the kingdom of God he's not stopping the growth because there's individuals like myself and others worldwide who are coming up in faith, who are going out and to evangelize, to, to teach and to love on people and to serve the people, which shows that God has not forsaken. He has not, for, he has not given up on us. He is constantly ever present. Another thing is to make sure that you always wear and bring with you to the battlefield the word of God, which is the spirit sword. His word is our ultimate weapon against the enemy. 
it's it's our it's our guideline our code of ethics as you would say it's it's how we operate on a day-to-day -day basis um so keep that try to keep that in mind as you go through your day-to-day -day hassles um today's sermon is going to be called victory over death and some people may look at this title and think wonder really victory over death how can you have victory in death but as the scripture says is to to live is to lose but to die for christ is to gain and that's something that you know speaks volumes to me because honestly when we're living for christ and we're willing to die for christ then we are gaining an eternal life with him because honestly you know life is meant to be enjoyed it's meant to be fun and it's meant to have its pleasures but at the same time though we have to step back and realize what is really life about um versus what is death about because death doesn't necessarily mean it's the end it's just the beginning because we get to get reunited with our heavenly father so before we dig into that you know um, we're going to start off our uh our sermon today with our victory confession those who are victory watchers you know the words those who are just now tuning in for the first time um, you'll get to learn it very well we say it at every beginning of uh, our sermon simply because it reminds us that our best days are still ahead of us so all those who agree with me please bow your head for a second and just repeat after me I'm here on purpose because I have a purpose my heart is open my mind is ready to receive because God is not finished with me yet my best days are right in front of me and I have victory in my life because Jesus lives in me. And all those agree, say amen, amen. And before I get too into this uh, topic, before I go into prayer, it's one thing that I've noticed that during this fear series I've been going through, I've been tested. I mean, this has been like one of the most crucial times this last month, constantly being hammered by the death of fear of lack of finances or lack of patience or lack of understanding i mean all these things the enemy's been trying to hit me with for the last you know month and it's really tested my ability to endure this situation or actually not endure but to overcome it because honestly you know i can we are trained from little high to into adulthood to that we have to endure all type of circumstances and though the enemy thinks that we're too weak to do that but little does it really and this is why it goes back to the fact that the, the enemy the devil has brain damage because he thinks that we're weak, but we're really not. Because in our weaknesses, God's grace shines the best. And honestly, you know, and that's something we have to hold on to God's word when it comes to that. Um, you know, moving on with the topic at hand, most people are afraid of death. I mean, they most there's so many different fears that come come with death or the idea of death. Um, so before we get to in today's sermon, um, I just want to first of all, I just want to, you know, bow our heads and make a prayer. And first of all, I just want to thank God for another opportunity to speak his word. I thank you, Father God, just for allowing us to be in your presence. Thank you, Father God, for just allowing us to wake up in your presence. Thank you, Father God, for just allowing us to be here in your earth, on your earth, Father God, at such a time as this that we are here for a purpose. Thank you, Father God, for the resources that you have provided. Thank you for the equipping us with the love and grace and mercy and the forgiveness that only comes through you, Father God. Thank you for allowing us to open our eyes and our hearts and our mind to the enemy, knowing that he plays tricks on us, Father God. We thank you. We come to you boldly, Father God, knowing that we are human, that we are flesh, and we die to our flesh every day, Father God, knowing that we put you first and we put you of glory, Father God, because we give you all the praise for all the things we have today that we had yesterday that we will have tomorrow. We thank you, for God, Father God, for never forsaking us or forgetting us or for abandoning us, Father God, knowing that you are forever present in our lives. We ask you, Father God, to continue to let your word manifest in our hearts, Father God, so we can come to you boldly knowing that we are saved by you. We are loved by you, and we will continue to grow in you, Father God. Let our choices today and through this week that's coming up that we choose to follow your example of love, Father God, not our flesh. And please, Father God, allow us to forgive ourselves for our moments of weakness of doubting your power. And please, Father God, allow us to have the strength and humility to forgive those who challenge us who belittle us and who think little less of our worth, Father God, knowing that their opinion does not matter in the eyes of you, Father God, knowing that you are the Almighty, you are the forever, you are the beginning and the end, that no weapon formed against us shall ever prosper as long as we stay faithful to you and your word, Father God. In Jesus' my name, we thank you and praise you, and we thank you again, Father God, for all that you're doing and all that you will do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, I hope most people had a great week. Um, to me, it was a very busy week. Um, not too much about my own personal business, but it's just been really challenging lately. And I think, obviously, throughout this whole series of fear that I myself have been challenged with 
oh, having fear, fear of lack and fear of abandonment, or even sometimes a sense of fear of rejection. Because often sometimes rejection doesn't necessarily mean you're rejected because of a woman. Sometimes you can feel that through your peers, through your coworkers, um, through your family, your parents or siblings. And it does happen because sometimes most people's mind is not open all the way. And we gotta get with the times, people. Not, oh, what was done back in the old days doesn't necessarily make it right here in the present. That's why sometimes there's a thing called evolution. We intentionally tend to evolve. But one thing that's always been the same since the beginning of time is the word of God. His actual guideline of love lasts all the way back to the aspect of Genesis. His love has never changed from Genesis to now. And I know a lot of people are outdated in their thought process that what era they lived in, how they were raised, who raised them and whatnot, and how they were taught. They think it, 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 it may have worked back then. Doesn't necessarily mean it's gonna work right now because we have to understand the concept that the new generation now is different. I mean, some of us were born with, or we were not born, but we were raised by one parent. Some of us raised by none. Um, and you know, and how you were raised um, whether it's in the church or out of the church is a big factor, but also a contributing factor is the fact of how we have to overcome fear through victory is the fact that regardless if you had one parent or two parents, how your parents raised you, it, it enabl enables you to actually function in today's society as far as were you taught that fear was acceptable? Was it okay? Can you conquer it? Uh, does it describe, does it define who you are? And honestly, in most cases, Fear does not does, does not describe who we are. It just describes a circum a feeling of a circumstance, and sometimes we often often lose ourselves in those circumstances because we're so overwhelmed. And I think honestly, the worst thing you can do as a as a parent or as a believer is to put your fears onto somebody else or or give other people fear. You should never want to willingly give people fear, especially knowing how sensitive that topic is and knowing how much power and control it could have over you if you're overwhelmed by it. I mean, honestly, you know, there's some people who are still growing in their faith. Their faith may not be strong enough. And there's some people who hadn't came to the faith yet and hadn't had accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. So they're not better equipped to handle the stress of other people's fear. I think nowadays, you know, we have enough fear going around. We don't need to add on more. I mean, I'm just, that's just my perspective. The only thing I can say at the end of the day is people, let's get it together, honestly. So moving forward, like I said, this is my 18th sermon in my victory series. Um, so it's chapter three. I'm not sure how many more chapters I'm going to have in the fear series because fear itself is such a big topic. And nowadays it's running rampant. So, but um, I'm just going to continue to do whatever the Lord puts on my heart and, uh, you know, speak on it as best as I can to my knowledge and through my experience. Because at the end, the best ministry is our personal experience. So, so moving into today's topic. So just like so many things of life, we live the life that drives us. And I mean, like, like the life that drives us, I mean, like we're so about living life. We're so about enjoying it, enduring it, overcoming it, one of the case or the other. And sometimes we seek constant validation from other people around us. Uh, rather it be siblings or peers or parents, that we're enjoying our best days. Our best days are still in front of us, but sometimes we get lost in the aspect of that excitement. Um, for example, like the excitement of driving a fast car or skydiving or serving your country by going into the Army, Navy, or Air Force, or maybe an activity that could cost you your life. And, you know, sometimes we're adrenaline junkies. We want to experience life to the fullest because we're only given one life. We're only given one opportunity and the flesh sense to really enjoy life. And sometimes we get sidetracked about, about the feelings of those around us, basically because we're too busy to think about us and our excitement. Um, and for some of those who do some of these things to excite their life, it doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing. Yeah, driving fast cars in a safe environment, great. Skydiving, yes, take the initial precaution, go through the proper training and go skydiving. Best believe, live your best days. But what I mean by living out of excitement alone is mean, we shouldn't lose ourselves in the excitement and sin. Like, make we shouldn't take excitement in causing pain to other people. That's not excitement. I mean, that's not godly excitement. That's not what God put us here. He put us here to serve, not to cause pain. And my thing is, you know, uh, when it comes to excitement, I think my biggest excitement in my lifetime, honestly, was when I was actually, you know, I had the badge and I was out there chasing people, criminals, and people who broke the law. Um, that was like, to me, was like the best highlight of my life simply because I was still young. 
I was going through all this training and I got to see so many different things and experience so many different type of characteristics and people and environments. And it brought a lot of potential opportunities of death for me because, you know, throughout my career um, of doing it, you know, I mean, I was stabbed twice, shot at six times, hit by a car once, which was really interesting. Never had that happen before, but it was very interesting. <laughs> um, you know, and it was excitement for me at that time so because I didn't have a really good understanding of what my life was about. I was all about the money that came with it. I was about the excitement, the fun, the thrill of the chase. Back then, I didn't really think about what God's purpose of my life was. I was more or less thinking about me and not Him. And that's why I think to my personal experience is that we lose ourselves in those ex moments of excitement. Like when we're ex ex uh, chasing a, a new female or a new male, um, we're lost in that idea of what they look like and what they may offer us, but we're not really thinking about what do they really have to offer us as a whole. Um, and I know sometimes we tend to lose ourselves in that concept and even myself in the past, and I still get challenged with it every day because the enemy knows our weakness. He knows what we fear the most and he knows how to get us and he will use whatever tactic or whatever lie he can to get us off that. So keep an open mind and open heart when it comes to recognizing the tool of the enemy when he's trying to get you to feel fear. So we're going to dive into the word today. Uh, we're going to start off in Romans. Yay. Honestly, you know, I think it's very exciting, you know, reading God's word because it does sometimes, no, to me, it's not sometimes, all the time, it brings a bit of closure. It reminds me that I shouldn't fear the enemy because the enemy has already been defeated. And not only has the enemy already been defeated, but it's, it's basically trying to fight a losing battle that it will never win. It will never win over our souls because our souls and our bodies belong to God. Because we were created from God, and thus we belong to God, and that we choose to honor God and praise God because He gave us this life. So we're going to start today in Romans 14. Romans 14, for those who are following along, um, verse 7 through 9. I actually came better prepared today. I actually kept markers in my Bible, so I won't have to waste a lot of time like find, searching and finding it, at least in the beginning part anyway. So we're going to start at verse 7. The scripture says, if your gift is serving others, serve them well. If you are a teacher, teach well. Now, when you talk about serving well, if I believe that God gave us a lot of gifts and talents that's in us. And honestly, you know, our job is to honor God by using those talents and gifts to serve him, to bring him glory. So, like, I think, honestly, one of my gifts is a serve, is a gift of leading. I like to lead people. All my jobs I've done in the past has always been about leadership, whether it be a general manager, assistant manager, or some type of supervisor. Serving people is, is to me, is actually leading them to the right course of action and, and, and helping them learn. I mean, iron sharpens iron. I say this a lot So because we have to be able to encourage others as they encourage us. We have to be able to, our faith is is in itself is power to help uplift other people to not only seek the kingdom of God, not just to follow the, follow God, but to actually give him the glory that is his right in his right only because it's only because of him that we're here. It's only because of him that we get to enjoy all the modern technology from our phones, cameras, our laptops, you know. I mean, these things get constantly upgraded all the time, but the one thing you cannot upgrade because it's, it's already complete it's already perfected it's already to me it, in my own perspective it's perfect which is the bible it's the best book out there to read every day um the second book you know that i recommend you know for some people is the basic laws of attraction which is the second greatest book outside the bible um because it helps encourages not just encourages but it actually imparts more wisdom that you know the Bible itself imparts a lot of wisdom, and there's so much of the Bible that can be kind of complicated, but don't lose faith in it, though, because honestly, this is why fellowship is required. This is why having victory over relationships is, is fundamental, because building a relationship with other believers can actually help strengthen your knowledge and strengthen your understanding of God's Word and His teachings in our life. So back to the word here, we're going to verse 8. If your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. If giving uh, give generously. If God has given you leadership ability, take the responsibility seriously. And if you have a gift of showing kindness to others, then do it gladly. So what I mean by that was, I mean, if obviously you're going to be generous, don't give light. You know, um, our tithes and offerings talk about 10%. Don't do less than unless you can't afford it. God wants us to give what we can. He doesn't really say you have to give this. But his thing is we give what we can because we believe that he will 
not just reward our faith, but he will love us on a different, on a higher level because we are able to say, you know what? We don't longer fear where our finances are coming from because we know you are our provider. We know that you will provide everything we need, and God does that. He wants us to be able to step outside of faith when we're choosing to be generous to other people. And he talks about kindness. If you're going to be kind to somebody, don't just do it based off your own understanding. Do it off of God's understanding. Do it in a sense that where it's like it's genuine. You should generally want to be able to treat people with kindness because it is God's word. I mean, going against God's word is not the best thing. It's not healthy. Um, I learned that person myself in my in my time I mean, as far as like growing up and even now i'm still learning that every day requires a challenge you know like there's this girl at work you know who i work with and we're on this conveyor belt together we're you know we're sorting through you know recycling stuff and whatnot and there's sometimes where i, I could feel she's upset or hostile because you know me i like to move at a fast pace i'm like oof, boom boom just trying to go through the workflow as quickly as possible because i'm all about moving at a fast pace because half the time i'm when i'm working i'm listening to uh, hear some praise and worship while I'm listening to a sermon. So I'm like constantly hype, hype, hype. And so while we're sorting through recycling stuff, I tend to grab as much as I can. And sometimes I feel like when she grabs something and I grab something, our hands connect on that and she pulls and it's like, and I feel like when I pull harder, you know, cause me, I'm, I'm a competition person. I, I, I look at it as competition to a certain degree because it helps me get through the day of work. So when we're doing it, I grab a snatch it and like, I can feel like she gets mad about it and she'll like hit trash or other recycling items, my direction or whatever. And she'll just get me a dirty look. I'm just like, whoa, I'm just trying to work fast pace here, you know? But I feel that since sometimes in myself, I feel like, wow, is she is like, is she trying to like, you know, antagonize me? Is she trying to get under my skin somehow by showing that she's offended by some reason, you know, by my fast work pace, or whatever. I don't know. I don't know. But I, I try not to think about it as much, you know, much as myself. But back to the point at hand is be kind regardless. Because honestly, showing love can beat out any sin. It can beat out anything. If you go with any, into any situation with love on your heart and understanding, you can beat out any situation. So, and it says, and finally, verse 9, don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. Now, that itself reminds me of my own thing, situation with dealing with parental issues because sometimes it's hard to really love someone when they when they feel like when you feel like they don't love you on God's level when you feel like they love you on their own understanding through their own uh upbringing how their upbringing is different from how they treat you today and my thing is when it comes to upbringing you should never really use your upbringing to justify how you treat your kids or how you treat your siblings or your coworkers because it's not that's not accurate it goes against what God says I mean, we shouldn't pretend to love people based off our own understanding, but love them off his understanding because his is perfect. Ours is flawed. Ours is biased. I mean, I somewhat, I've never really been to that situation with my daughter as far as, you know, raising her differently, even though it's like, it's been a very difficult battle raising her simply because I have been putting myself in a situation where I deal with the, the mother who's very difficult, but I never really experienced that opportunity to really raise her how I saw fit. And, and it's probably a good thing, you know, that, you know, to a certain degree, I look at it as a kind of a good thing that I have not because I've been in constant development. I've been going through so many different storms, wondering what's going, what, what the next move is. And this is why I came up with this topic, Victory Over Death, because we all don't know when the time is coming. We don't know if it's coming tomorrow, it can come in the next five minutes, it can come next year, we don't know. I'm trying to prepare myself for what it's going to be for like an eternity, not just what it's going to be like with my end result when I'm 60, 70, or maybe when I'm 36. Who knows? So I try to think, try to take a little bit better moment of that. So when it comes down to loving people, being kind of people, and sharing your gifts and using your gifts to honor God, we have to do it with a sense of genuine faith in our hearts that we love people, even if their opinion is different, even if their perspective is different from ours, because we're not here at all to agree. But at least at the end of the day, at least we can say we understand each other. Because at the end of the day, we're all going to go back to the same place. We're all going to go back to. We're all going to stand before judgment for God. So that's something we all do share. We share the fact that our life is going to end, regardless of how it ends. We're all going to share that same cause that it's going to end, and then we're going to stand in front of God, being judged, and then He will decide if we served Him. Not only did we accept His Son Jesus Christ as our heart, as our Lord and Savior, but what did we do with the gifts that God gave us? Do we use them to serve people, to help people, to encourage people? Or do we use it to belittle people, to criticize people, or to make them feel insignificant? 
And that's something I think, honestly, I, I think, God, that I was never that person. You know, lucky enough, my mom never taught me to, to really talk down on people. Now, granted, that's something that the world taught me. Um, but I'm glad that I never really had that mentality. I never really had that mentality to say, I'm better than her, I'm better than him, I look better, I sound better. No, at the end of the day, that doesn't really matter to me, honestly. I mean, I'm so simple that being better than other people really doesn't matter. Now, am I, can I be competitive when it comes to like sports or uh, activities at work or something like that? Yeah, because I think it makes it more fun. It doesn't make it where it's work anymore. It's it's a pleasurable enjoyment of being the best. And sometimes, you know, I thrive to be the best, not because I want to be better than them, because I want to be better against I, who I was the day before. Because I honestly, a lot of people don't really give me a lot of credit that who I am now is way different than what I was about nine months ago. I know you may be thinking, oh wow, nine months, that doesn't sound very long, but it actually, if you know the old habits of me, then you would know, dang, you've come a long way. And I like to encourage people, it's never too late. You do, you can you can change whether it's in church or it's in the park or you're in jail from one state to another. It doesn't matter where you're at in life. But it all, but the only thing that really does matter is your choice to believe in Jesus Christ and to accept him. And not just accept him, but to learn about the Father. Your ability to manifest that in your heart, that knowledge, and constantly increase it in your mind and to let it grow up here and let it grow here is can change anything so but moving forward i'm getting a little bit off, a little bit a little far fast here but uh so most people fear death because they wonder is there hell and honestly and to my perspective yes there is a hell it talks about it all through revelations um and next question we tend to ask is did i use the time wisely to honor god and that's one thing i think honestly like i said previously before that how we choose to use our time will matter to god if we're using it to help people and to serve people, then I believe we are using our time very wisely. We are using it to the best of what God has given us. But if we're using it to tear people down, to criticize, to hurt, to manipulate, to lie, or whatever, then we're doing a very dishonor to the gifts that God gave us. And yes, I know we're all guilty of it. I'm no different. I'm a sinner just like the rest of you. The only difference is, though, with my situation is that I'm trying to out, out overcome that sin with the Word of God. And honestly, most people don't really seem to get the idea that you're not going to find sanctification in alcohol. You're not going to be redeemed by another female or male. You're not going to find forgiveness in the circumstances of the world. But you're going to find all those things in God, in his word. So that's something we have to be able to continue saying, you know what? Am I going to continue to chase the things of the world that's going to give me temporary happiness? Or am I going to chase God and get eternal happiness? Because that's something that we all should want. So I spent most part of the week trying to, to learn this. Um, I guess it's pronounced Ecclesiastes. Um, that's where we're going to go into our next chapter here. Uh, chapter 3, verse 1 through 8. Um, let's see here. Let me go ahead and find that real quick. That's one I probably should have looked up, but I didn't. But I believe I remember where it's at here. And it took me a little bit to, to say it because it's really difficult for me to pronounce it. I don't know why. I think I just get like tongue-tied, I guess. I spent some time in the, in the mirror saying Ecclesiastes. <laughs> Let's see here. No, it's here somewhere. Do, 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 do. This is what I probably should have tracked down. Ecclesiastes is going to be... Oh, 538. I know it was on there. Just had to find it. Okay, so for those who are following along, um, you can turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 3. It's going to be verse 1 through 8. The scripture says, For everything there is a season, a time for every activity under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to harvest, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build up. A time to cry and a time to laugh, a time to grieve and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones and a time to gather stones, a time to embrace and time to turn away, a time to search and time to quit searching, a time to keep and time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to mend, a time to be quiet and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, 
a time of for war and a time of peace. So me itself, it tells you that it reminds us that there's a season for everything. There's a season for our believe it or not there's a season for that we will overcome we will have uh, financial issues there's a season of heartbreak there's a season uh for happiness laughter sadness there's a season for everything and the one thing it tells us that, dude, that scripture i just read is that it's not meant to last forever there's a time for everything so one season may be a time of sadness but guess what right around the corner there's a season of healing there's a season of happiness growth i mean we have to be able to know that or we have to find the strength in the Lord that there is a time for everything. And he is not going to give us a, he already knows what we're going to do. He already knows what, how our life's going to turn out. He already knows that. But he's leaving it up to us as a choice to what path we want to take. Do we want to take the path of happiness or do we want to take the path of hate? And, but then again, just because, and just, I'm just, so for those who have a lot of hate in our heart, uh, I've, I've been there. It doesn't mean we always stay there. Eventually that season of hate will end. We will outgrow it. And we will find a way to replace that hate with love. And eventually it will overshadow that hate. And then eventually we'll get to a point where we're at peace. So that when the time comes when we do die, then we at least know we die with no regrets. And that's one thing I want to make sure in my life before it ends is die with no regrets. That means mending all relationships, whether they're past, present. Um, you know, make sure that, you know, those who I've hurt in the past know that that was very wrong of me to do these things. And that and I'm sorry that I did those things. Making amends with people is, is a good part of healing. That's another aspect of victory over death because at least you know that when you die, at least you made it right. Or at least even if you didn't make it right because there's some people there who are stubborn who just won't take your forgiveness, but at least you know that you made the effort to do, forgive yourself. And I know that's the biggest, hardest part for most people. It's not just forgiving other people, but it's forgiving ourselves. So in another question we ask ourselves, will death hurt? How will we die? Is death normal? And honestly, we don't know if it's going to hurt because we can go in so many different ways. Um, we don't even know how we're going to die. There's no, no point even worrying about it. I mean, honestly, we shouldn't focus on how or if it's going to hurt. We should be more focused on enjoying the present moment and enjoying every day serving God. Because when we take the time to serve God instead of serving ourselves, then we don't worry about if death's going to hurt or when it's going to happen or how it's going to happen. You know, granted, there are certain circumstances where death is unnatural through accidents and by cause of somebody else hurting you or something like that. And it's very painful. It, hurts, it, it can harden the heart of most people because we feel a sense of injustice. But everything has a reason. I'm a very firm believer of that. And no, I don't condone murder. I don't condone people killing people for whatever reason. I don't condone that at all. Um, because it's very saddening because to take a life from somebody long before their purpose has been fulfilled it doesn't sit well with me. Um, and I think it doesn't sit well with a lot of other people out there. Um, but sometimes at the end of the day, we don't have a say so, you know, I mean, we just have to accept that it does happen. And when it happens, we have to choose to either hate or we can choose to love and forgive. And yeah, I know it's hard and it's challenging and it's going to be really challenging moving forward because there's constantly so many things happening around the world these days. But we have to make an effort and that's all God asks us to do is to make an effort to seek him because only in him will we find the peace and the things that happen to us and to those that we love around us. Um, and Jesus reminds us in John uh, eight twelve that saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of have the light of life. So to my perspective, how, what I took from that scripture was the fact that, you know, when we choose to follow him, the things of the world doesn't tend to bother us as much. I mean, we're less stressed. We're more happy. Poverty doesn't bother us. Racism doesn't bother us. Even diseases other don't bother us. Yeah, we take precautions to help protect other people, like wearing our mask everywhere we go. You know, we, we take that into consideration, but we don't fear what's coming because we know where we're going to end in the end of the day. We know or as far as we're going to, we all know that we have, as believers, we understand that we're going to be in front of God at the end of the day. Whether it's next week or next month or next year, we're going to end at the same place. So we no longer fear certain things. Like me, I don't really fear death at this point. I welcome death at this point. Simply because I know at the end of the day, I'm using my time wisely now to let go of the sins of the past. To heal myself daily. To forgive those who constantly still wrong me, even today. I do my best to try to just overlook it and say, you know, Lord Jesus, please forgive them for their t for their error. Please forgive them for their weakness because they don't they don't quite understand what they're doing. And some people don't. They may consciously believe in their mind that they're doing what's healthy for you. But a lot of times, I don't think they see the big picture. But then again, that's 
for them to come to that conclusion. You know, all we can do is continue to love them, forgive them, at least communicate with them, say, hey, I don't agree with this. I don't like it. And if they still continue to do it, walk away from them, pray for them, and still love them. Because at the end of the day, if you continue to have unforgiveness in your heart, when you die, there's not a good chance that you're going to go to heaven and serve your father. So we got to make sure we keep that in mind when it comes down to hostility towards our neighbor. And it says, that whoever, as he says, whoever follows me will, will not walk in darkness. It means he is our light. In, in, in him, we have the ability to illuminate our day, to illuminate our life and everything we choose to do with our lives. We can choose to live our best days now and for tomorrow by following someone who was perfect, who modeled a perfect example of how we should treat each other. And that's something that I think sometimes we tend to forget sometimes because we're so caught up in ourselves being selfish or about having things our way and being in control that we're, 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 we're taking control back from the person who gave up everything for us. He gave up his life for our sins, for our pleasures that we, that we do day-to-day -day basis. And that's something we have to be able to come to the conclusion that we have to honor him. We have to accept that. Because at the end of the day, whether you accept him now when you're 40, you're 50, 60, 70, 80, you're going to have to point in your time in your life, you're going to have to accept him. Otherwise, you're going to spend your eternity away from him in a dark place, being tortured, and not living in love. You're going to be and living in hate and all that other negative sin. So I just encourage people to really think about that. Because like I said, I'm no expert in it. I'm far from it. I'm still learning. I'm nowhere near perfect, not even close, not even halfway. And I know that. But I know that every day I wake up, I wake up with a sense of knowing that I'm going to try harder today than I did yesterday. So I read a study back in 2018. There was a statistic chart made up uh, about the total deaths in the U.S., which was roughly a high number. As I looked at the chart, there was some issues that, that stood out very, very clearly to me that there's so much death happening that most of us are not even com co are not common, that we're not aware of. Um, excuse my tongue tied. I get when I do my teaching, it's really hard. Um, but the chart was it said these are some these are some of the issues, the basic five issues that I saw that stood out. Um, heart disease: six hundred fifty thousand people died in that period of just of uh, heart disease. Uh, six hundred thousand people died of cancer. Um, there were preventable, preventable injuries, about 150,000. Uh, chronic lower respiratory disease, 150,000 people died in that year. But off these things alone, imagine. Those are just some basic things that, that happen every day that we're not even conscious of. So just knowing that number, if you did the math on that, imagine how many people died that year off those issues. And imagine, and that's not counting suicides or stroke or, or murders. That's just basic things that tend to happen to us because we don't take care of ourselves spiritually, uh, emotionally, uh, psychologically, and even healthy. We don't take care of our body. If you add it up, that's a lot. That's a big number. And that should only remind you that so many people are losing their lives day in and day out. And they're leaving this earth unhappy. They're leaving this earth unfulfilled. They're leaving this earth with their purpose still intact. And some of them are doing it out of their own accord. They don't realize that they're wasting their time. This is why you can never waste time in God's presence. Because in his presence, he will f help you find your purpose. And he will show you your purpose. That you, way you can maximize your life based off that purpose. Part of my purpose now that I learned in my incarceration was that, you know, me, I have to use my time to serve others rather than hurting others. I have to use my time loving on others and sharing people my story and my experience. Because knowing that my experience can help prevent another person from going through that. I like to think, you know, honestly, you know, <clears throat> following generous recursive for those who don't believe in it, I do believe generous recursive to exist because some things that I learned that I inherit from my mom is stubbornness. <laughs> I love my mom to death, but she can be stubborn, but it's not like a bad stubborn. You know? Hers is just stubborn because like, for example, like her thing, she's all about her kids. As long as they're happy, she's happy. And so there's something that I tell her, I was like, mom, take care of yourself. You, don't worry about me so much. You, I'll be fine. She said, no, as long as I'm your mom, I'm going to love you, blah, blah. And, and granted, sometimes it's annoying hearing it sometimes because I'm like, mom, take care of yourself. Like, really? But it's comforting knowing that my mom puts her own well-being to the side for us, no matter what age we are. 
And granted, I wish other parents would follow the same suit, but you know, hey, we, we can't, beggars can't be choosers, you know what I mean? We have to, we just have to accept things we cannot change. But I love that, that, my, that I got that from my mom. I also got hard work. My mom works very hard. She worked hard her whole life to support five kids on her own. That to me is an empowerment of what a real woman should be like. Um, you know, and honestly, you know, those are the top two characteristics of my mom that I love the most. You know, and, and she never gives up. She's never given up on anything in her life. <clears throat> unless she was forced to have to. And I model that same example from her. I, I don't mind working hard. I don't mind working two, three jobs because I know at the end of the day, I got to provide for my family. Um, I got to provide, you know, for the kingdom of God in their shape, way, or form. Um, some characteristics I think I inherit from my dad from his generation. The, we both share the aspect of being incarcerated. You know, rather his was prison, mine was jail. The fact that we were both incarcerated. It doesn't matter at the time, but I followed in his footsteps in a certain degree. And another thing I think I inherited from him was his anger, his control issue. Um, granted, these are negative aspects and negative traits, but they also help identify that an era in my life that I need to grow in. And though that they are negative, but God can turn those negative things and turn them into something positive. Because necessary, you can have control over certain things, but it depends on how you're using that control. Is your control serving somebody or is it hurting somebody? Um, anger has the right to be valid. Um, I'm not going to get too much into that because that's another sermon altogether. But how you choose to show your anger is key. And that's something I just, I'm going to leave it right there. Because um, I think I've used up a lot of time already. And I haven't even got to one of the points I want to make yet. So, but generational curses can happen, but we can break those with the word of God. We can break those generational curses through him. And that's something I want to encourage others to do. So moving forward, we're going to jump into... Uh, I see how you pronounce this one. This is another one I have a hard time pronouncing. Um, Deuteronomy. Okay, yeah. Deuteronomy 31, uh, 6. It says, Be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be in dread of them. For it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. That is a promise that's worth living for. That's a promise worth striving for, knowing that God will never forgive us. I mean, not forgive us, forsake us. <laughs> He will never forsake us and he will never abandon us. That is a, a promise that should give you very much joy to praise God, knowing that no matter if you're a sinner, if you're an alcoholic, a drug user, abuser, uh, a manipulator, liar, whatever, God will never forsake you. He is always fighting for you constantly. So never lose hope in that. So here's some about five different things. Real quick. I'm going to try to go through them as quick as I possibly can. Um, how, to, how do we have victory over death? So we're going to start the first one in Psalms. Um, my first one in Psalms is be in God's presence. So number one is being in, in God's presence. So we're going to turn to chapter 16 real quick in Psalms. I just had it. Let's see, Psalms. Where'd you go? I just had it. Okay, so those who are following Psalm 16, Psalm 16 to 11, it says, the scripture says, you will show me the way of life, granting me the joy of your presence and the pleasure of living with you forever. So being in God's presence knows that he shows us life by being in his presence. By being in his presence, he is giving us an example of what life should be like and not only helping us, but he's leading us. He's teaching us through his word. And knowing that we have joy in his presence constantly, because in him we can find joy, we can find peace of mind. So there's something that we have to, that we can take away from his word is knowing that the scripture reminds us that in him is joy. He offers that and that the pleasures of living with him forever should be our final result. So when you talk about overcoming death, victory in death means when we die, we're going to be in God's presence, which means we will be no more sin. At that time, no poverty, no diseases, no hate, no coronavirus, no racism. It's just love and joy next to the Father. So, and number two, accept Jesus Christ in your heart. Accept Jesus Christ in your heart. And for that one, I went to Proverbs. Uh, so we're going to flip over to Proverbs real quick here. I say Proverbs. We're going to go to Proverbs 18, Proverbs 18, 24. <clears throat> the scripture says, there are friends who destroy each other, but a real friend sticks closer than a brother. 
So back into my old topic of virtual relationships, it's kind of, it's kind of where I tie that into that. So because when you have people who truly support you, whether they're siblings, friends, coworkers, whatever, when they really truly accept you and sticks close to you, it's a sense of joy and love that you should always hold dear to your heart. Um, because it's really hard finding people who can honor true friendships. And even it's even hard to find someone who can honor a true relationship as far as a marriage. You have to stick close to those who really support you. Not only those who support you, but those who encourage your growth. Those who encourage you to be happy and to be positive. You know, I saw a video on Facebook where there was a basketball player who's walking and, and above the catch he says, this is what a real friend does. And the guy was looking down and his friend or his team worker or his, his uh, teammate came and lifted his head up. You know, that's his time he was having covered. He didn't have to say anything. He just did something that physically to encourage, say, keep your head up. Don't give up. And number three, take control of your life. Now, when it comes to taking control of your life, it's not always easy. It can be kind of challenging because we're often like we're often discouraged by or we can often get discouraged by life and it's all of its cha challenges. But it reminds us in Mark uh, chapter 7, number 20. Jesus says in the scripture, and then he added, it, it was what comes from inside that defiles you. For from within out, from, for from within out of a person's heart comes evil thoughts, sexual morality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, wickedness, deceit, lustful desires, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. So in other words, is guard your heart from these things. And I mean, because by guarding your heart is, is your heart is the most sensitive thing that about your being, your existence, your heart. That's why God says in his word, guard your heart. Because if you don't guard your heart, these things will plague you. Jealousy will run rampant. Homos, uh, homosexuality or other things that it's not of God will overtake you. Now, I don't condemn those who, who choose to be atheists or people who are homosexuals or transgender. I don't, I don't. I don't hate them. I don't think bad on them. If anything, I encourage them to really find happiness with their choices. I mean, and sometimes it's accept because loving people means accepting what they choose because we can't force people to change, but it doesn't mean we don't have to love them. If anything, we, just, we choose to love them more because they need that love. They need that acceptance. So make sure that you guard your heart because all those things I mentioned, adultery, greed, wickedness, deceit, lustful desires, those are things that are tools of the enemy that he uses constantly to, to that we should feel these things or we should do those things that that goes against god's you know word number four learn to accept death is natural so my aspect when it comes to death i mean that's why i say me myself i accept death gracefully i mean i'm at the point now where i'm not ready to die don't get me wrong i'm not but at the same time i'm not going to live in fear of it because i know eventually we're all going to go through it we're all going to have to go through that whole aspect of it um, and I picked out a verse here in 2 Timothy. So for those who are following, go to 2 Timothy uh, chapter 4, uh, verse 1 and 2. It says, I solemnly urge you in the presence of God and Christ Jesus, who will someday judge the living and the dead when he comes to set up his kingdom. Preach the word of God. Be prepared whether the time is favorable or not. Patiently correct, rebuke, and encourage your people with good teaching. Now that one speak, spoke a lot highly to me just this past week when I was talking with my dad where it reminds you in this part here, it says patiently correct, rebuke, and encourage your people with God's teaching or with uh, good teaching, I'm sorry, with good teaching. So my thing is when you're a parent, rarely you were an absent parent or you're a parent who have been there the whole life, whatever, it doesn't really matter. When it comes down to instructing someone, you should always basically do it off a sense of love. I know a lot of people have different beliefs. You know, they some people believe that as a, as your parent, like me with my daughter, I would love to to look at as far as my daughter is not just my daughter, but she's also my best friend simply because I want her to be able to be comfortable to talk to me and then come to me when she starts experiencing problems of life. Um, but I like to think treating your kids as as just as your kids and not trying to be their buddy. And, and I know some people have different perspectives on it. I don't think you should be buddy buddy, but I think you should be close enough to them as a friend where they can come talk to you. Because if I'm if I have a child and my child doesn't feel comfortable coming to me about drugs, they're gonna go talk to a friend. And a friend might like drugs or they may do drugs and they could potentially influence my child to do drugs because they didn't feel comfortable talking to me. And that's something you never want to encourage 
uh, uh, your kids or your friends or coworkers. To model God's love means you have to have a sense of openness to where people can come to you and confess to you their sin. Because it says in the word that we confess our sins to one another as brothers and sisters so we can grow, so we can sharpen each other and to encourage one another during those dark times. Um, the last thing is, is uh, number five, plan, plan, plan for, as I get the keys to come up here, plan for your passing. You should always, and what I mean by planning, you should never like plan like, oh, I'm going to die at this specific time, this certain place. No. What I mean by this plan for you is plan to have a lot of things done. Like plan to really like have yourself situated. Like have your purpose, like if you already found your purpose in God, you already found like your identity, where you belong, what you're going to do, plan to build things up to where that purpose never dies. Like, for example, like if you go into uh, ministry, like I'm doing now, I'm leaving videos that someday may be seen years down the road, maybe after I passed. Um, and I wanna make sure that whenever I leave this earth, that my word is still here. And not by my word, but God's word that's through me, my experience, because my experience may be different from yours. And you know, a lot, a lot of people has never dealt with poverty. A lot of people has never dealt with growing up with uh, roaches or living out in the streets. A lot of people may have never dealt with abusive parents or uh, aggr overly aggressive siblings. But through those teachings, we know that there's a higher power. We know there's a savior, Jesus Christ, who died for our sins. God gave up his only begotten son for us, knowing that this man gave up his life for me, for my sins. It's so encouraging. It means a lot. And there's times where I can get in my head and I think, no one loves me. No one's here for me. And no one respects me. But even though the enemy tells me all these things, I know deep down in my heart, I only need Jesus' love. I only need God's love. Yeah, you know, we, we encourage love for between our siblings, our parents, and our, our spouse, and our kids. Yeah. But at the end of the day, they're, most of them are subject to their feelings, and feelings can change. The scripture has never changed. In over a hundred thousand million years, the scripture hasn't changed. It's been the same. And a lot of people would change based on their feelings and their mood. But the love of God, the sanctification, the redemption by the blood of Jesus Christ has always been the same. And I encourage people to continue growing in their faith through Jesus Christ because only through Him can we come to the Father. And it says that in the Scripture. If we deny God, if we deny Jesus Christ, then God denies us. The one that it says throughout Scripture, the number one sin that that, that God can, is that's unforgivable to God is blaspheming God, saying that there is no God, that, that Jesus is nothing. That's the worst crime you can do, ever. You can go out there and sell drugs, slang. You can gang bang. You can go rape. You can go molest. You can do whatever you want to do and still be forgiven by God. But you forsake His Son, His Son that died for you for me and for everybody in the world that's unforgivable and I and I recently heard a pastor recently just this past weekend how he described how sometimes we don't become where we can be religious but sometimes we can be conditional atheists and what I mean by conditional atheist means that we believe the Lord is the God of our finances but when we're going through a crisis with our finances we don't believe that he's the Lord in that circumstance um, I think I'm trying. I'm trying to do my best to explain it because the way he explained it in the sermon was very, was really right on. But it, it did resonate with me because there's sometimes where, in the season I'm right now, where I'm fighting my finances, and I'm having a hard time learning to say, God, I trust you, my finances. You are my Jehovah, my Je my Jehovah Jireh. You are my provider. And there's sometimes where we question that it's because I fear. Just like this, if, like if you have somebody who has cancer. They sometimes they, they think that God doesn't have the power to heal. He does. And we, we, we seem to think that we we seek God and we praise God and whatnot through so many different circumstances. But when it comes down to when we're hit with the circumstances, whether it be our finances, our health, our kids, whatever, sometimes we say we fall back and say, wait a minute, is he really there for us? Is he is he really our provider? Because this is happening and we question God and we should never do that. And I know we're human, it's gonna happen. All I'm saying is that when it does happen, be quick to repent. Give your knees and pray. And praise God that He will make it work. He can turn any bad situation for your good. 
Jesus. He just had to have the faith to walk with him. And the whole topic of today is victory over death, that there can be victory over death. It means by planning, plan for your passing, plan to leave this world with no regrets, it means always love people every day. Love them, encourage them, stick it out with them, be there for them. Because that can last forever. It's not what you leave for people that's a legacy. It's what you leave in people that's important. And you want to leave the legacy of love, God's love. We want to be able to transfer that over to the next generation. You know, I plan on having maybe one, maybe two more children, maybe, if God wills it. <laughs> Whenever I find the right woman, maybe, you know. But uh, I want to be able to make sure that I leave that for my children so they can model to the next generation. I want to make sure that people who know me, those who encounter me today, will know that I was a man of love, not a man of hate. Accept Jesus Christ in your heart. Always want to do that. Because that is the beginning of your rebirth. That's, that's the beginning of your redemption, is accepting Jesus Christ. And if you feel you're here today during this you know, podcast that you're not quite right with God, and you feel that you strayed some way, in some way, whether it be lust, sexual issue, finances, greed, jealousy, or anger, if you find yourself in that situation, Take a moment, pause this video, and just take a moment to repent. Give it to God boldly and just say, God, take this anger from me. Take this lustful feelings from me. Take the sexual morality issues away from me. Take the moment to get to peace with Him. Because before you can have peace with those around you, you have to have peace with yourself, and you have to have peace with God. And secondly, if you find yourself that you haven't accepted Jesus Christ in your heart as your Lord and Savior, this is your time. It's never too late to accept Him. Take the time to just bow your head and say, that's me. I accept him in this moment because he accepted you even when you were a sinner. He accepted us even though he died long before we ever existed. He made a conscious decision to die for us, for those who are back then, those of us who are now, and those of us who are moving forward, and those who are yet still yet to become. So think about that. When you, when, like, like this, this, this song here, Give Me Jesus, like when I think about it, when I listen to it, it, it gives me a sense of peace knowing that Jesus is my everything. And, and I know sometimes I can be conditional about my love for Jesus because I'm still human. I'm still growing in my faith. That's why I say it's never too late to grow. You can still, ha you can still grow. Just take that opportunity. And I want to finish up in John uh, chapter 5. So those who are, want to follow along with me, John chapter 5, I'm trying, I'm almost at my hour mark here. Um, John 5, uh, verse 24, I tell you the truth, Jesus says in scripture, I tell you the truth, those who listen to my message and believe in God who sent me have eternal life. They will never be condemned for their sins, but they have already passed from death into life. It says itself right there. Those of us who listen to the message and believe in God, we walk with Him in eternal life. It's there for you. Take it. Embrace it. And honestly, you know, remember that your best days are still ahead of you. God has not abandoned you. He has not forsaken you. He has given you a sense of atonement. It's never too late to get back on the saddle and move forward. And I'm sorry for taking so long on this message. I kind of got carried off a little bit there. Um, I hope this message encouraged somebody or many. I hope it's brought you some little better of understanding, at least my perspective, what I think victory over death is. Because people may think there's no victory in death, but there is. We know that you're going to stand before judgment from God at the end, knowing that you will stand in front of your, your Savior, the person who put you here, and that most of your questions, actually all your questions that you have, will be answered. Then you know that you have love and you have peace of mind. Um, I'm sorry again for this not being my best video, my best sermon, but I think honestly, it was, it was a, very tough, a very tough subject to talk about. I just wanna remind everybody that I love you. I hope you guys have a great weekend. And for those who watch this and those who are not, I wish and pray for you guys well. You find peace in your decisions and you find peace with yourself and find peace and acceptance with God. Knowing that he is your Lord mighty alpha and omega and he's only here to make sure that we serve him that we love him 
and that we walk with love and with great integrity and we don't fall short of even though we do fall short he's there to pick us up and he's there to forgive us so i wish you guys a good weekend thank you for listening i look forward to seeing you guys next week love you guys <laughs>